the arrest of the Deputy Chief Justice cannot and shouldn't be a whimsical decision as part of our greater purge on corruption. I hope that the Director of Public Prosecution has considered all the factors, including the unintended consequences of arresting a high caliber state officer, such as the Deputy Chief Justice. Number one, there is a question of incontrovertible evidence, not evidence that prima facie can lead to a conviction. You need a higher threshold when you're arresting someone of the caliber of the Deputy Chief Justice because of one, the serious reputational injury mm -hmm. that if you look at in terms of Article 166 that requires the Deputy Chief Justice to be a person of repute, to be a person of integrity, of character, and impartiality, this, the arrest in and of itself effectively kills her career. So I hope the DCJ, I hope the DPP took that into account. Number two, I hope that they took into account the unintended consequences in terms of casting a special, not just on the DCJ, but on the entire judiciary as a critical plank in the war against corruption. Mm -hmm. If you are accusing the Deputy Chief Justice of, being, of, of having a compromised capacity and integrity, what then does it mean for the entire judiciary? I hope he took that into account. Number three, I hope that the ODPP took into account the critical political climate in which the judiciary works. There is a very stubborn perception mm -hmm. that the political elite are hell-bent on manipulating or interfering with judicial independence. So the war on graft, insofar as the judicial officers are concerned, cannot be framed through the usual lenses of mere suspicion of mere prima facie evidence. Because, and most critically, there had to be other mid-term ways or other short-term or other halfway measures of mm -hmm. dealing with instances or allegations of corruption. I think it, is not, it would not be considered as a manipulation of the Constitution or favoritism or, favor, of, or, or preferential treatment if the ODP assessing the evidence as it were, discussing with the Chief Justice and advising the, the DCJ to resign voluntarily. That would have still had the, 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 a, a near similar effect of resigning while preserving the integrity of the judiciary, while preserving the integrity of the Deputy Chief Justice. But the manner in which he has acted this is a very stern test on the, the DPP's own in decisional independence. Right, and Steve, the DPP said in, in his statement that uh, he met the Chief Justice David Maraga this afternoon and informed uh, and uh, he was seeking uh, to be given consent for the arrest and prosecution of Deputy Chief Justice Philomena Mwilu, which appears that uh, that consent was given. And he goes ahead to say that um, he is convinced that the evidence they have uh, is sufficient to, with a reasonable prospect of conviction, if, and, it, and also it's in public interest that a criminal proceeding should be uh, preferred against the judge. So uh, when you say that he needs to have made all these considerations, it would appear that talking to the CJ, and of course from the assessment of uh, the evidence, uh, as by law required, it would appear that it's sufficient. Would it still have the same uh, repercussions? I think the critical issue to consider if there is going to be an, a critical error in judgment, then even the ODPP himself might find himself going home for interfering with the career of someone. Mm -hmm. But if the CJ was well informed and well advised, mm -hmm. then we can expect that let him not waste more time. In terms of public communication, let the CJ and the JSC, because you can, what, you, what you can expect is that one of the, an ordinary Kenyan is likely to petition the Judicial Service Commission within the framework of Article 168 to initiate the process for removal. So you see the DCJ is going to battle a criminal case against her. She's going to battle uh, possibilities of, uh, of, of a tribunal to require her removal. If you put all this into, into, into consideration, in terms of sound judgment, it may have been better, even in terms of public communication, that the DCJ is given an opportunity to resign honorable first, mm -hmm. And then if the ODP people wanted to pursue prosecution, they could consider that not as a serving judicial officer, but as a retired judicial officer. Mm -hmm. There's a stark difference if you are reigning in court as serving deputy chief justice and an immediate former deputy chief justice. I can only pray that the CJ had taken all these factors into consideration because what you will be fighting longer is the perception that corruption has seeped and deepened in the judiciary. 
And how they manage this is now going to be very critical. It's just, it goes beyond the mere allegations right. that the DCJ was engaged in graft. So what options does the DCJ have right now? She's a serving DCJ. She is behind bars. She'll be taken to court probably uh, later today or early tomorrow. What options does she have? I think the DCJ must appreciate that she's been humiliated, rightly or wrongly so. And if she were to consult her advisors, mm. I, would, I would suggest that she resigns honorably. I don't think it is, it is in her place to insist, to, uh, to insist on facing judicial proceedings, criminal proceedings against her, while wearing the title of the Deputy Chief Justice. Already that is enough embarrassment already. If I were her, I would step down from that position because then the issue is this. Can you really re-emerge from a criminal trial and you know it's painstakingly slow? Can you really emerge, rehabilitate your reputation, return to the bench and serve with honesty, diligence and impartiality that the Constitution requires? What about the unintended disruptions because you know Kenyans are litigious in nature. What if someone, somebody continues maybe in the, in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. requires her to recuse herself from hearing certain matters? What if someone petitions JSC? All these are unintended disruptions that may come to bear because of this uh, uh, arrest and the possible arraignment in court. I think for her now, let her reflect and bow out in honor as, be, as opposed to being humiliated further by being subjected to a tribunal. But, but in the past, we have seen uh, judges or officers of the judiciary being taken through such processes and even coming back, uh, case in point, uh, Justice Philip Waki, um, uh, after the radical, what did you call it, radical surgery within yes. the judiciary. What happens then to the presumption of innocence, which should still apply for the DCJ? Should, be, should she just respond to the humiliation or should she not just commit herself to fighting for her innocence? You see, the presumption of guilt, the presumption of innocence preserves your ability to continue working. But in sensitive positions such as judicial, such as uh, uh, judgeship, you know, and the magistracy, the perception, the mere perception that you're facing criminal trial, not because of a petty criminal offense, mm -hmm. but because of graft. When the judiciary is intended to be the critical plug in the war on graft, effectively, if you ask me, deals a fatal blow mm -hmm. to her career. Right. Now, it's going to be a critical balance. Nobody is saying that she can't fight it. There. In fact, if it turns out that these charges and these are fictitious, <coughs> then I think in terms of making sound prosecutorial judgment, even Nodin Haji himself might find himself in problem for ruining someone's career and right. bringing it to an abrupt end. Because then what it means is that someone of the caliber of the deputy chief justice, once you exit in such an acrimonious, dishonorable, and inglorious manner, it makes it difficult for you to reinvent yourself and access employment in other public offices. I mean, all these factors, some must have been considered and must have been communicated even prior. Mm -hmm. I think the decision to arrest and prosecute could have been delayed, if you ask me, to allow the CJ, the DCJ, opportunity even to reflect and resign in advance. I'm not saying that somebody should interfere with decisional independence of, of the director of public prosecution, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that a matter such as involving the deputy chief justice, caution and care right. and discretion is very necessary, not just whimsical decision making just because you think there is prima facie evidence that can support charges. Right. We're not talking about a low threshold that can sustain charges at the court. We're talking about you, this is one of the cases that you need incontrovertible evidence, cogent reasons, if you believe you have cogent reasons, you have this incontrovertible evidence, mm -hmm. then in terms of facilitating what is called plea bargaining, you could arrange the process of trial to include a, nego a negotiated approach where the DCJ stands down mm -hmm. or effectively resigns from service. She's arraigned. If there's a, a allegations of misappropriation, the funds are returned, then she serves a, sort of a, a, a shorter sentence, then she retires peacefully. But an abrupt move of arresting her at her place of work may work well in terms of public communication of a heightened or increased uh, velocity in one graft. But when the, things, when the dust settles, you will realize that the adverse effect may be longer term and more difficult to deal with. But, but, but 
talking about that, well, then what happens? We've seen the war on graft, how it has been faced since uh, the beginning of this year. What we've seen is that uh, uh, such kind of events happen. You see people uh, getting arrested at their homes. Their homes are raided. They are arrested at their places of work. A case in point, even recently we had uh, the former governor of Nairobi taken uh, three years and then the courts, the National Land Commission Chair, Dr. Mohamed Suzuri. So why would, it, would the standards apply differently for the Deputy Chief Justice who is a suspect just like any other? We are not having a discussion around a conflated approach where different standards are being applied for different state officers, no. The law requires impartiality and equality in the, in, in, I mean in approach. But what we are saying that this is a critical office holder. If you are going to arrest the Speaker of the National Assembly, you're going to arrest the Speaker of the Senate, you're going to arrest uh, the Chief Justice, you must reflect and be sure mm -hmm. that this is the ultimate decision that is inescapable, that this is the ultimate inescapable decision. And you must be sure that when you arrest, you, when you effect such arrest, the evidence will almost certainly lead to a conviction. Right. And because the evidence will almost certainly lead to a conviction, mm -hmm. there has to be a negotiation, you can attempt a negotiated approach because of the critical office these people hold. Listen, and Sam. And it's allowed within the law. That is allowed within the law. Just like you can summon someone, instead of arresting them at their home, you can summon them to present themselves at the, either at the police station or in court. Right. If you ask the, the DCJ to, to present herself in court tomorrow morning, uh -huh. of course she'll be there. Yes. You know, but if you, if you, if you arrest her commando style, because, just because the law allows you to do so, you must also take into consideration the critical and sensitive office and the nature of her work, so that even after her exit, what is the unintended consequences on that office? You see, an arrest of a private citizen may not require much reflection. Sure. But an arrest of a critical, sensitive office holder, certainly by common sense alone and good governance, mm -hmm. requires reflection, requires discretion, requires that you are slow on arbitrariness in, the, in terms of application of your powers, requires that you access other options that can exist, that can help you achieve your mandate without necessarily disrupting the entire system of governance. Right, and still we receive, we're receiving information that uh, the court has allowed National Land Commission boss Mohamed Suzuri to resume uh, office, and the court rules that, um, uh, to access office rather, uh, the, the, the court says that uh, a constitutional office holder cannot be ousted of a criminal offence. If we are to go by this precedence, would that still apply for the Deputy Chief Justice who occupies a constitutional office, who sits in a commission, uh, an independent commission, the JSA? First of all, I find, that, I find that position untenable in law, sorry to say, because public officers, state officers, are required to preserve the integrity of those offices. These are offices that are held in public trust. Mm -hmm. If you are accused of criminal offenses and have been arraigned in court and the charges relate to manipulation of your office, abuse of office, then effectively you have eroded the confidence in that office. Mm -hmm. So as a common sense issue alone, so Azuri shouldn't go back to that office. Similarly, as a common sense issue, it will be untenable for the DCJ to continue sitting in court, presiding over matters mm -hmm. that require integrity when her own integrity has been impeached in another court. That is why I'm saying that all these factors needed to have been balanced. It is not enough to say presumption of innocence is enough. You can't waive the sanctity of presumption of inno innocence to continue serving in a critical, sensitive office that requires that the perception of independence, perception of impartiality, perception of good character and good judgment be preserved at all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what happens to, of course, talking about the Supreme Court, it needs uh, a quorum. Uh, uh, they have uh, six judges now. Uh, th th there's a judge who, uh, would you say predisposed? I don't know whether he is back. But yeah. uh, it's eventually, what does it say about the office of the Deputy Chief Justice? Because this is not the first time we're having an issue with the Deputy Chief Justice. Remember the case of Nancy Barraza who uh, left after that uh, infamous uh, event uh, at Village Market? I think it's just a sad coincidence that the first two DCJs have had uh, probably now what looks like an acrimonious exit, uh, an ceremonious exit. I wouldn't want to relate it to that office being jinxed in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, the instances surrounding the DCJ, former DCJ, uh, Honorable Nancy Baraza's exit are completely different from this one. But if you ask me, in terms of assessment of gravity, I think the charges now levied against the DCJ, Philomena Mwilu, are more serious and more significant 
that even the idea of subjecting her to a, to a tribunal itself may not, be, may not be very beneficial to the entire judicial image. So I think this is a matter that what I would require the Judicial Service Commission to do. Let JSC not waste more time. Mm -hmm. JSC should communicate publicly <coughs> the level of engagement they had with the ODPP, their appreciation of the issues at hand, and allow the DCJ now time to reflect. Of course, we don't expect her to be, to be, to, to be, to be back to work the day after tomorrow just because she's been released on cash bail. Sure. We expect her to reflect, and I think the better way, mm -hmm. because knowing Kenyans as we are, somebody as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, somebody will petition JSC under Article 168 to initiate procedure for removal. Right. It's a very lengthy procedure. It's very injurious in character. It is almost impossible to emerge from it and continue serving. Mm 